Should I go ahead and play the video, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. Um, hi, I'm Margaret Sexton, and I'm president of the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards. Um, Charlotte Wildlife Stewards is our name, and our mascot is a native barred owl, as you saw on the video. And the barred owl speaks to the heart of our mission, which is to create, preserve, and protect wildlife habitat through education, engagement, and enjoyment. Our leadership team also would normally have which I would normally have stand during this time, um, consists of our executive board members, uh, Ernie McLaney, who is the past president. Thanks, Ernie. Donna Bowles, um, our vice president. Uh, Eric Mick, who is treasurer. Caroline Binniger, which is our secretary. Um, and the directors include Amanda Cargyle, Donya Hawley, Clyde Kaiser and our members at large are Connie Harris and Sandy Dixon. Um, our educational programs will be virtual for the foreseeable future, uh, like the one tonight. We will also be hosting some in-person events following COVID-19 protocols. Our future monthly educational program topics, which are the second Tuesday of each month, include all about bluebirds, the benefits of insects and anthropods, Mecklenburg Nature Preserves, uh, pollinator gardening, and the truth about mosquito spraying. And when we can again meet in person, we will be meeting at Sardis Baptist Church, which is on the second Tuesday of each month, is um, normally September through May. And that's at the corner of Sardis and Rama. Uh, on Sunday afternoon, November the 22nd, we've had to postpone this since it was originally scheduled for the 15th and we've had some uh, scheduling conflicts. We will be hosting a one hour I Spy Nature Walk at the Sardis Baptist Church, which is the same bat place. 
which um, and at beginning at 3 p.m. same bat time um, for any of those who know what that is. Uh, again, to follow safe protocols, all attendees must wear a mask. Uh, and we do have some available if you don't have one. Uh, Pre-registration is required and in-person attendance will be limited to 20 people. Uh, in October, we kicked off our third year of participating with PAWS of Gaston County to provide the dry ingredients for venison meal kits um, for our local food pantry. Um, this year, we donated 50 venison spaghetti and 50 venison chili meal kits, which were distributed by Hearts Beat as One Food Pantry. Special thanks to the local Harris Teeters, Food Lines, and Fresh Markets for donating the dry ingredients, and to Donya Holly, who is our events and proje uh, projects chair, who coordinated all of our efforts. These meal kits provided a high protein meal for over 400 people in Mecklenburg County. Um, make sure you're checking out our social media for dates, locations, times, details. Uh, we have two more member-only events planned this season, five more I Spy nature walks, and another Trees for Trash cleanup, as well as a give back event. We just did a Trees for Trash event where we picked up over 720 pounds of trash in uh, the city of Charlotte. And special recognition goes out on that one to um, Pioneer Springs Community School, uh, headed by Sandy Dixon, who picked up a huge amount of that 725 pounds. Um, to become a member of the Wildlife, Charlotte Wildlife Storage, you only need to pay $25 annually to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and list Charlotte Wildlife Storage, or CWS, as your chapter. And that's located in the drop down box, uh, I, I think at the beginning of the second page on the registration. The membership fees allows the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and us to fulfill our missions. If you would like to be more than just a member, we would love to have you volunteer at any of our events or serve on the leadership team. Please reach out and let us know if you're interested in any of these opportunities. Again, as a reminder, be sure and visit our website like our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram and Twitter for current events and programs. Do partly to Charlotte uh, now having uh, 1,365 wildlife um, habitats. Charlotte has been recertified as a North Car as a National Wildlife Federation certified community wildlife habitat. And in 2018, Charlotte was actually ranked number eight nationally in the top 10 cities. Uh, of the US um, for wildlife habitats. So, and it's easy to certify your property uh, as a uh, National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat. You just go to the National Wildlife Federation uh, site and certify your property it has food, water, shelter, and a place to raise young, and that you're follow following sus uh, pra sustainability practices. So that's all I have. And if you haven't, didn't hear this initially, uh, please mute your phones so that there won't be any background noise. And now I'm gonna turn the program over to Donna. Okay, can we see this? Looks perfect. Okay, cool. So um, we do wildlife rehabilitation of native mammals and reptiles. A little bit about me, uh, Don already said a good portion of it, but I started CWCC. I worked in Africa and I was always determined to live there and rehab uh, African species. I came to Charlotte and I realized that I could do just as meaningful work here right in my own backyard. Um, I, drive, I drove down the street all the time, I still do, see um, hit by car animals and the impacts, constant development, and trees being cut down. So I thought that is really important work to be, uh, to work here in Charlotte. So I started the Carolina Wildlife Conservation Center in April 2019, so we're fairly new. Um, I have a background in zoological medicine, that's me at the Bronx Zoo with an elephant shrew. And I'm a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So I've gone through all my licensing processes and we'll talk about that. 
And I studied vet tech, veterinary technology in New York, and a lot of people ask me what you have to do, what degree you have to have to do this. You don't have to have a degree, but it helps. Our wildlife rehab director, Ruby Davis, has a degree in wildlife biology. So she's always using those skills and she's also been licensed for 12 years. So she has a lot of experience doing this as well. So a little bit about us, that's our barn, our horse farm that we have converted into our wildlife clinic. Uh, we're located in Iron Station, North Carolina, which is right next to Denver. We um, are on 105 acres of conservation land. So the land will never be developed. It was being looked at for de by developers. And um, I actually just got a letter in the mail of somebody who wanted to um, buy the property and I happily said no. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we run solely off of donations for all of our vet care, our diets, um, all of our medicines, our enclosures to take care of the land, everything to do with animals solely off of donations. We don't get grants. We aren't uh, state or government funded. And so that's the, the converted horse barn. We have many, many outdoor enclosures scattered through the woods, which the animals love. We work with vets and vet clinics. So we take our animals to cl different clinics. We work with wildlife officers, animal control officers of several counties. They're amazing. They bring us animals all the time. And we have a huge focus on the conservation of the land and its animals. And we're not open to the public. We get that question all the time due to state regulations for the safety of people and the animals. We're not allowed to have people come and visit the center. So that's our current number of animals that we have rehabbed this year that we have brought into the center. The reason I'm showing you this is not to brag, but it shows the scale of the need of what we're doing. Um, I believe that we're providing a public health service because we're taking wild animals, which can be an inherent danger to the people. We're taking them out of the public's hands and we're getting safe and um, making sure we're, we're sticking to all of our protocols to be safe with the wildlife. So this is our center, the center aisle of the horse farm that we converted. We have our washer, dryer, tri triage area, tons of blankets, all of our carriers, a giant sink where we wash fleas off our animals. We have a kitchen that we are in all the time. Um, we make extensive diets for our animals. Um, we have a fridge and freezer, of course, get lots of donated deer meat, venison meat. I heard you mention that we use venison all the time. And this is one of our rehab rooms. Uh, it's kind of empty in this photo because it's be coming towards the end of our baby season. Um, but normally it's just jam packed full. I mean, we still have a lot of animals, but nothing like we did over the summer. I also forgot to mention if anybody has any questions during this time, please feel free to ask. I think you can type it in the chat uh, portion of the program and I'm happy to answer anything as we go along. I'd love for this to be interactive instead of me just talking. Uh, a little bit about our land. We're a certified wildlife habitat, which is awesome. We're not in Mecklenburg, but we're in Lincoln County. Uh, we have 105 acres, so I think that the land looks like a heart shape, kind of upside down. Um, most of it is wooded. We have three ponds, which is amazing. The pond that's right here is going to be our beaver pond. We're building a beaver habitat there this winter. So that's where we're going to rehab beavers and otters. We have our center here. We have another pond here, which we didn't know about till we moved into the property. Another big pond here. And um, the rest of it is woods with streams and tons of diverse ecology. We have rolling hills. Uh, we found um, different types of plants that are endangered. I mean, it's just really an amazing place for the wildlife. And right now, everybody is being released here on the land um, while the numbers and the land can hold the amount of animals that we're putting back onto it. So what is wildlife rehab? That's why you guys are all here to to know what we do. So I break it down to three different sections. First, the rescue, actually getting the animal, determining if it needs care and um, bringing it to the center. 
the rehab portion of it while it's at the center. What are we doing? How are we making sure that we're successful in the process uh, and getting it to be released so that it is successful when it is in the wild? This is the definition by the um, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Wildlife rehabilitation is the volunteer practice of providing care and treatment to injured or orphaned wild animals until such time as those animals are at an adequate, adequate level of health to be successfully returned to their natural environment. Um, we are all volunteers. We don't get paid. Uh, wildlife rehabilitation is a way of life for us. I live and breathe and sleep it. Um, and it's a, it's a really big duty to our animals and to our planet, I believe. So just to touch on it, some people might be wondering if you can keep animals or what the process is. It varies from state to state what you can do, but in North Carolina, you cannot keep wild animals as pets. These are our fox, and I was posting a lot of pictures of them, and I was like, I just need to let people know that we, these are not pets, that we don't plan on them being pets. We're not letting them run around our homes. We're very controlled with how we're interacting with them. So you can hold an animal for 24 hours while you're looking for a wildlife rehabilitator in North Carolina, but I suggest if you're in any state, finding a licensed professional or somebody who knows how to do this. There's places all over. We get calls from all over the state. And while we can't take animals from the Outer Banks normally, we will find somebody who can help you. So it is illegal to keep wildlife as a pet or to rehabilitate any wildlife without proper licensing. So a little bit about rehabilitating. Uh, it is a 24 hour, seven days a week job. Somebody the other day, we answered a call at midnight, I believe it was, and they were so thankful that we were there for them. And it's, it's what we do. We don't let animals um, suffer. We like to let people know that we're here for them when they're in that state of panic, when they find an animal, we like to be there for them and for the animal and do what we can. It's, uh, it's an extremely exhausting job, <laughs> like 24 seven days a week, of course, that's tiring. But on the other hand, it's extremely rewarding. We, I believe that the animals know when they're being helped. Um, you can get an animal that is just at the worst moment of its life and they just will melt in your hands and trust you. So we definitely create a bond with our wildlife. Um, and I believe that they know when they're getting helped, even when you're manipulating a bone and you know it's painful. I know that they know that they are being helped. Um, so some people might say that we're interrupting natural selection, but I believe that a lot of the animals that we get are due to human intervention and not the animal or the mother may be choosing that that animal isn't able to survive. Um, a lot of animals that we get are from human interference. And also a, a wildlife biologist might say, well, you're not really helping the species as a whole. We have plenty of squirrels. We don't need to save more squirrels. Everybody has them in their backyard. And that's true, but it's also respecting that little baby squirrel that you have in your hand as an individual, an individual life and a tiny individual soul. So that's what we think. We are doing both, promoting conservation of land and wild places so that these animals can be free and safe, as well as respecting them as individuals. So what does it take to be a rehabilitator in North Carolina? There is a licensing process. They just changed it this year. So you can be an apprentice level. That's your initial level. You have to be sponsored by or mentored by a 12, for 12 months by an RA licensed rehabber. And you can only take possums, rabbits, and squirrels. Those are non-rabies vector species animals. After that, you can undergo an inspection and become a rehabilitator level where you're not mentoring with somebody. Although we talk to other rehabilitators all the time, you always want to bounce ideas off of people. So once you're connected in the community, you're always talking to somebody. And then there's the rabies species level, which is new this year. It's amazing. Um, the rabies species level 
is for our rabies vector animals. So I don't know if anybody knows what animal we have over here on in the picture, but those are our gray fox kits that we raised this year. We raised five of them. They were orphaned. One was from Raleigh. Three were from um, underneath the shed in the middle of Charlotte. Their mother was killed. Um, and then the other one, I believe, was from the Asheville area. So we get animals from all over. But um, we are so excited to be able to rehab these guys. The first time this year, it's been illegal, I think, for 25 years to take these species. So we've really, really embraced it. We love doing them. But it's a high responsibility. And you have to be rabies vaccinated and have your titers current, which all of us are. So the species that we rehab, we have our rabies vector species, which are the fox, bat, skunks, raccoons. Those are what we specialize in, but we get a ton of the other guys as well. Um, the non-rabies vector species. And let me say with rabies vector species, this means that they have the possibility to have the rabies virus. That does not mean that the animals we get are rabid. So there's a difference. So that's why we take precautions with our PPE, our personal protective equipment. We quarantine our animals and we have a high level of responsibility with handling these animals, but it doesn't mean that we're getting rabid animals all the time. And then our non-rabies vector species, the squirrels, possums, rabbits, or not raccoons, groundhogs, beavers, bobcats, otters, chipmunks, and reptiles. So I believe that we do work of conservation. I call it conservation through rehabilitation. On the left is our eastern box turtle that was hatched in our box turtle habitat. I think I have a photo of that later, our habitat. So that means that our turtle came in, she was not gravid or she did not have eggs that were fertilized and she was fertilized in our habitat and in order for animals to mate they need to feel comfortable so it shows that we're doing a good job that they're feeling comfortable to do their natural instinct of mating and these babies were incubated successfully in the habitat and then they were hatched and they were released back into the wild we also do bats now this year, which is very rewarding and we're so grateful. Um, that's an Eastern red bat. Our bats are um, starting to, or they're already declining in population. They're super, super important for our economy. They pollinate cotton, rubber, bananas, agave. If you like your tequila, you want your bats around. They eat mosquitoes, um, so we, are going to hopefully work with the state to do bat mist netting, which is catch, putting up a net and then at um, dusk and then seeing what bats you pull down, what species and kind of recording that information, which is super cool. So the first part of rehab is rescue. First and foremost, you found wildlife, you found an injured animal, something you think is orphan, something on the side of the road, what do you do? Uh, you handle it with care and caution always. I don't care if it's a little baby bunny, you need to be careful. Everything when it's scared has the potential to bite. We don't want anybody to get bitten, then we have to take extra procedure, especially with our rabies vector animals. So handle it with care and caution, put it in a box. Please put it in a box. Um, or keep an eye on it. There's been so many times when people have an injured animal and they've left and they come back and it's not there anymore. And it just breaks our heart every single time when an animal we know is suffering or needs help uh, gets loose and goes away and then we're not able to help it. Uh, once you have it safely in the box, and I'll explain later how to put it safely into the box, keep it stress-free dark, warm, and quiet. And then do not feed it, don't give it water, it will be able to survive that short period of time without water, and call us immediately. If you're not in our area, call a rehabilitator, call your local wildlife agency, call 311 or Animal Care and Control and see if they can refer you to a wildlife center or a licensed rehabber. Uh, just get as much information as you can and uh, try to find a professional. So the way that we get animals is through our hotline. So we have taken probably 10,000 calls this year, we estimate. 
um, and answered them. They're not always animals that come in, of course, but we answer things from injured animals, animals in their house, um, animals living under the shed, birds. We get calls from, like I said, Outer Banks, Asheville. There's a ton of different reasons we get calls. Sometimes we get calls for um, fishing, which I always refer to the state, but we, we get a lot of calls coming through. So that's how we get our animals. Once we have that, that call on hotline, we go through a, a procedure in order to decide what needs to happen next. So the person has found an animal, hopefully they have it secure in a box in a dark, warm, and quiet place. And then we need to determine what needs to happen next. Can we reunite that animal with its mom? Can we explain how to humanely remove the animal uh, from the attic or from under the shed without us having to intervene? Is it just doing something natural? Like, is it a mama fox that is out hunting for food while her babies are sleeping in the daytime? She looks perfectly healthy. She's doing her normal thing, but somebody's concerned about that. Or does it need to come into care? Is it um, sick or injured or truly orphaned? We always, always ask for photos. Photos are number one. So that's our best way to determine what's going on with the animal. This photo is a little baby possum. Her mother was hit by a car and she, it was raining that day. So you can see she's soaking wet, curled up right here. And we um, obviously had her bring that little baby in and we rehabbed and released her. So is it truly orphaned? I have a photo of bunnies here because people really like to think that bunnies are orphans when they aren't. So with bunnies, the mom only comes at dawn and dusk. So a lot of people say, I haven't seen mom. Well, mom doesn't want you to see her. So that doesn't mean that they're orphaned, but we get a lot, a lot of bunnies. Ruby, who I work with, does a phenomenal job with bunnies. They're notoriously hard, but she's like the bunny whisperer. So we get massive numbers of them and they get to cuddle together. So with bunnies, something we can do to determine if they're orphaned or not is put a tic-tac-toe pattern over the nest. So you have the nest of bunnies. You don't know. We've gotten a photo of them. We think that they look pretty healthy and then we don't know if mom's coming back. So what you can do is you can take a uh, string and put it over the nest in a tic-tac-toe pattern and then see if that string is moved after um, a certain amount of time. So you'd want to wait for dawn or for dusk and that will show you if mom is coming back to feed her babies. But photos we can get um, to see if, what the condition of the babies are. It's not true that if you touch them, then mom won't come back. You should definitely use gloves when you touch any wild animal, but that is a myth for bunnies. So um, touching them to get a photo is totally okay, and we always ask for photos. A single possum is always orphaned, so possums are on mama's back. She can hold up to 13 of them, and um, Sometimes one of them will fall off, and when one falls off, she doesn't know. So that baby will normally be in the yard or somewhere, and it will be calling for mom. Mom doesn't know it's gone, and it won't come back. So a single baby possum, always orphaned, and we need it to come into care if it's a small size. The body condition. So that's why I'm saying let's ask for photos, let's get photos. Is it super emaciated and skinny? Does it have flies on it um, or fly eggs? Then we know that it needs help. Are there ants on it? Do, is it bloody or does it have open wounds? Um, another thing you can do is a skin turgor test, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. So reuniting, let's say we have a baby squirrel, like we had a squirrel today on Hotline. It looked exactly like this little baby and it was at the base of a tree and um, the nest was right above in the tree. So I said, send me a photo. These are the things that I asked. Was it in a dog or cat's mouth? Is it bleeding or does it have any obvious signs of injury? Were there flies or ants on it? Uh, send me a photo. Let's see the body condition. Does it look like it has a nice round belly or does it look like it has a, it's very skinny. We can see all the ribs, its face is sunken in. 
So the baby looked perfectly healthy, like it just had fallen from the nest. And I determined that we were able to try to reunite the baby with its mom. So mom will actually come down and she will pick that baby up out of um, whatever container you put it in. Normally a box is just fine. You got to keep that baby extremely warm. If the baby isn't warm, it will move less. Mom might come down, smell it, and think that it has passed away, and then she won't pick it back up. So this is the example, a warm water bottle put next to that baby. I would suggest more to put it underneath this towel, just so we don't burn the baby, but um, that will do. Or a, a sock filled with rice, and you just put it in the microwave for a couple seconds, keep feeling it, and pop that under that baby to keep it nice and warm. Make sure that you do not feed it or give it water. That is an unfamiliar smell to the mom, and we found that mom won't come back after they've been fed. So just make sure you never feed wildlife in general. It's just a good rule of thumb, but especially a baby like this. And then keep them out of the sun. They can get overheated or get sunburned. Um, even if it's a warm day too, you still need to do an external heat source because a lot of the babies cannot thermoregulate, like the tiny little babies, they cannot thermoregulate yet. So you need to make sure that they um, are still kept warm, but out of the sun. And then mom, that can be done for 24 hours overnight. If the mom has not come back, let's say you found the baby at two o'clock, sun's going down at seven, mom hasn't come back, you can bring that baby in overnight, keep it dark, warm, quiet, don't feed it, put it back out at dawn, and then wait for 24 hours. They will survive without food or water for that amount of time, and it's important that we give animals back to their mother they do such a better job than we do. I mean, we do the best we can, but we're not mom. So some of the signs that we've determined that the baby is cannot be reunited with mom, like a baby orphan, baby possum. This is a mama possum um, with her babies on her back, or um, we decide that it's an orphan baby. So a single possum is always orphaned. Uh, does it have blood or broken, obvious broken bones or any wounds that needs to come into care? Is it skinny? Is it dehydrated? I'm going to show you how to tell that in a minute. Does it have fly strike? I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute as well. Or does it have ants on it? Was it in a dog or cat's mouth? I don't, even if you don't see an injury, if it was in a dog or cat's mouth, it absolutely needs to come into care. We need to look over that baby. It could have internal injury. It could have broken ribs and punctured lungs that are internal that you can't see. If it's in a cat's mouth, it could have a tiny, tiny puncture that turns into a giant abscess because cats have a bacteria in their mouth that causes horrible, uh, deadly bacteria. And so it could kill them. So if it's in a dog or cat's mouth, that's important that they come to us. And has it been kept or fed by humans? A, a big thing that we see, um, has it been kept or fed? And if it has, then we need them to come in or, or is it truly orphan? So this is a test that anybody can do if it's the right animal. So a baby squirrel like this, you can do this to uh, adult raccoon, you don't do this test too. But if it's possible, baby bunny, baby squirrel, um, this is a great test to tell hydration, and hydration can let us know if that baby needs help or not. So it's called the skin turger test or a tenting test. If you can do it safely, you take the baby in your hand, wear gloves. I'm not wearing gloves. I had this baby. Um, I, I'm obviously more experienced, so I knew I didn't wear gloves at the time for this baby, but you guys do wear gloves. Um, and take the baby and pinch the back of its uh, skin right by its shoulder blades or next to the side of the ribs and pinch the skin up like you can see here. And it should go down, it should go down softly, but if it doesn't go down and it stays up, then you know it's dehydrated. And this baby was extremely dehydrated Sometimes with dehydration, their pupils will go white because the body sucks hydration out of the pupils and anywhere it can. So this baby, um, its pupils was actually white. And so we knew that it needed to come into care. 
And the only way that we can properly hydrate a baby, you might see this and say, oh, I need to give it water. You, it cannot possibly absorb the amount of hydration that it needs in um, its body through its mouth and through the digestive system. So we have to subcutaneously give fluids to this animal, inject them under the skin for up to 24 hours or even longer sometimes, depending on hydration level. So fly strike. Fly strike is um, a, one of the signs that the animal needs to come into care. So this is a signs of it. I know it's not the best thing to see, and I'm sorry. Um, we don't want babies to have this either, but it's important to be able to recognize what this is. So it looks like tiny grains of rice. That's how, what we tell people. You can see it here. This is in the baby's mouth. That's normally what they do it or deep in the fur. They'll do it in the ears or this is back in the head. So just look for this or look for flies on an animal. If there's flies, you always know that it needs help. Are there any questions so far? Just wondering, anybody? We're good. Let me know. Happy to answer anything. Um, yeah, just there were just two questions. Um, yeah. One is, how did you acquire the property? Oh, how did I get the property? Um, I it was the first property I looked at. So I've always wanted to have a big piece of land. So. Um, I I started just looking for places that are going to be developed. So, um, and then we turned it into the center. Okay, did, um, did you, uh, how did it get the conservation designation? Um, so it doesn't have the conservation easement on it right now because you have to own the property. I think it's three years in Lincoln County. So it doesn't have the conservation easement yet, but it will. So we'll be going through those steps, but the property um, was saved from development and it was prone to being developed. I just talked to somebody actually who came to quote to do our fox habitat. We're building more fox habitats because I know we're gonna get a lot more foxes than we did this year. We did 16 this year, but I know we're gonna do more. So he came to the property and he knew everything about it. And I said, what, how do you know it? Sorry, can you hear? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me still? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and he was going to develop the property into five acre houses. So um, I'm really glad we were able to save it. Oh, yeah. And then just at the end of the program, could you provide your hotline number? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I didn't put that on there, but I can type it out. That's absolutely, yeah. And that's all on our website, and you can look it, look it up, but I absolutely will. That's a good thing to keep around in your back pocket. Yeah. It was, were there any more questions? That's all so far. Okay, perfect. So the animals that are coming into care, um, why are they coming into care? For trauma and injury? Are they orphaned? Are they sick? Are they kidnapped babies? Were they a victim of deforestation? Or were they a victim of the trapping and removal of their parents? Or um, we see a lot of poisoning, rat poison going on with our animals. So trauma, so this is a hit by car turtle. So um, the, this guy we put, or Ruby put back together, she's been doing turtle shell repair a long time. And um, so she was hit by a car. We see a lot of cat attacks, a uh, loss of habitat. We got a baby who had a chainsaw hit her, his face across. You guys might have seen that on our social media. Um, hit by cars like this, turtle, uh, falling trees, uh, falling from trees, storms, dog attacks, competitive males, mainly raccoons, will hurt each other. Uh, cat attacks are a huge reason we get animals. Um, so baby bunnies, especially the cats will find them. Um, they'll deglove the bunny like here, or this is a possum. Um, illness, we get a ton of foxes with mange. So that's very common. We can treat them on site or the person who sees them can treat them on site with a one dose of a medicine. But this animal was brought into care. Um, she, he was severe and we were able to treat him at our center and he was released. So that's our red fox that have mange. Um, or we get canine distemper virus, which is in our raccoon population. That's really, really common right now. I'm waiting to see what our numbers of distemper virus victims were this year, but they're really high. 
or parasite overloads, which can make animals very sick. So kidnapped babies or failed pets. Uh, it's, in, it's illegal, like I said, to keep uh, wildlife as pets in North Carolina and many other states. Um, people think that they're orphaned like the bunnies, but they're not, and they'll want to feed them right away, go out right away to feed them or keep them for a while and think they're going to be a good pet, and then they get older and they start destroying the house. A uh, big problem that we see is that they'll feed the baby and they'll get formula into their lungs, and then we have aspiration pneumonia, which we have to then treat with antibiotics, and uh, it can be really severe. We can have a transfer of zoonotic disease, especially with our rabies vector species, even just parasites, worms, or anything like that. So it's important not to keep these guys in your care. It's, I believe it's unethical. I don't think wildlife should be pets. It's not what they want. <laughs> they want to be out in the wild, and we want them to be out in the wild too. And like I said, they'll destroy the house. So this is Pipsqueak. He was uh, kept for five weeks. He is very small for his age, so he should be two to three times that size. Um, he was being fed this. This is a 1 ml syringe. So he was being fed this, and he should have been being fed this. So um, that's just a difference like based on education and just knowing wildlife. So he was severely um, emaciated and stunted in growth. He's doing great now and gaining weight, but he was getting fed a tenth of the amount that he should have been. So just always get those animals to a rehabber as soon as you can. We had some deforestation happen in our backyard. Um, our neighbor is a logger and she logged her 50 acres of property. Thankfully, this was right in the beginning, so we didn't have, we hadn't released any animals yet, but it's happening everywhere and the wildlife is really getting affected. I feel sick every time I see this personally. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, the, the trucks going down with the trees piled in the back. That always makes me just feel um, nauseous. So it's happening everywhere and the wildlife is feeling the impact and we're seeing animals getting affected by it. So this is our property and then these trees were taken away. And we tried to plead with her, of course, for the animals, but that didn't resonate with her. So these are some babies that their mama was in a tree when it was uh, the area was being deforested for development, and unfortunately, she didn't make it, but the little babies were brought to us. So here's them. They think that blanket is their mama, so they're licking on it, um, and we raised and released them. Can you guys see this video, too? Hopefully, that's playing. I think it should be. But I'm the only one allowed to cut down trees, says our beaver, JJ. Um, obviously, they're the natural tree cutters of the world, so we're good with them doing it, just hopefully not people doing it. So with deforestation, we get trapped wildlife. So uh, with them running out places to go, they're going into people's attics and homes under their shed. We get so many animals because of uh, Trapped, aunt, trapped mom, trapped dad being removed and uh, disposed of. And then a couple of days later, they hear crying babies and then were brought them. So we get raccoons a lot and fox and squirrels. And this is a, a raccoon that was left on a roof for a long time in the hot sun. And these guys, actually, we convinced them to release them, which was awesome. I love when that happens. Humane ways to remove wildlife. They're choosing your house because it's dark, warm, and quiet. So take those things away. Do bright lights, radios, apple cider vinegar, repel all, balloons, motion sensor waters, which is good for deer eating your garden. And you must seal the hole and no mothballs afterwards. Um, those will be toxic to the animals. And these are our beavers. Um, they're kissing, they're so cute. And a little, I know that's kind of a depressing topic, so here's a little bit, oops, did that, can you guys see? Here's our beavers fighting over an apple. You already ate all your apple. You already ate yours. <laughs> 
a little, the beavers always make you smile when you need it. So now that we've determined from all those different types of uh, ways that we can see an animal needs care, uh, what happens next? This is a raccoon I picked up the other day. He was hit by a car and he's still in our care. So you've determined the animal needs help and you need to transport it. So this is a little video on how to get it safely to the center. This is Ruby and me. If you find an injured animal, there are some tools that you'll need to be able to get them safely into a carrier so that you can bring them here to us at Carolina Wildlife. Things that I recommend using always would be a thick pair of gloves. These are welding gloves and a thick towel. A towel will be your best friend when handling wildlife. This is our striped skunk. He was found in Huntersville with a broken leg and the people use these tools in order to be able to capture him and safely bring him. If you find so that's how I'll use thick gloves, thick towel, thick blanket, scoot them in the carrier and bring them to the center. So once the animal is in care, we get all the information from the Good Samaritan, where did they find it so we can return them home if we need to, how long did they have it, was anybody bit? We get to do a triage, a treatment protocol, our hand rearing plan, quarantine for our RBS animals and our housing. Triage, we go through a thorough exam of an, our animals. We use personal protective equipment, always. Um, we protect ourselves with thick gloves, regular latex gloves, um, suits if we need to. We have to know the anatomy and the normal of each animal. A possum's body temperature is lower, so we need to know that. Um, and we need to know what is a normal bone where everything is. We look for bleeding, wounds, broken bones, hydration. Is it in shock? Is it body temperature low? Does it have pneumonia or other signs of illness? Um, we go through our treatment protocol. What do we need to do now? We've determined that something's wrong. What is wrong and what do, how do we fix it? So this is a fox in our incubator. We did a fundraiser earlier this year to get this oxygen chamber. So we've used it a million times. It saved so many lives. We're so grateful to everybody who donated to help us get this machine. So we determined the medications and how long is it gonna be on that? How many times does it, does it take that medicine a day? Do we need to get uh, surgery on something? Do we need to do a bone repair or uh, cast a wound or a broken bone? Do we, how do we clean the wound? Uh, we have a squirrel that has a wound right here on our chest from a cat attack. So we determined what we clean it with, what we pack it with, um, what antibiotics she's on and what pain meds she needs to be on. Or is it sick? Do we have a virus or pneumonia, internal, external parasites? Do we need to deworm the animal? Do we need to put it in the oxygen chamber? These are all things we go through. We go through so many steps. Here's our fox, Butter. She came in with pneumonia. She's coughing. Her eyes are watery. She was alone for quite some time. She was really emaciated when she came in and we um, did the fundraiser for the oxygen chamber for her. So hand rearing. So everybody thinks this is like the main thing we do. We feed cute and cuddly animals and we totally do. I, we absolutely do and I absolutely love it. But there's so much more that goes into choosing what the best thing is for that animal, what's most natural. So we have to choose formula. Every single animal gets a different type of formula. We have to take in consideration their need for fat, their need for vitamins and minerals. What uh, way do we feed them? Do we have them lapping out of bowls? Do we have them sucking a syringe with a nipple? What nipple do we use? Um, we have all different size and kinds. What size syringe do we use? There's just so many variables to feeding these guys. Do they need an external heat source? What is their diet when they're weaning off of formula? What's their enrichment? What do they do? You can see these skunks have a dirt box in here so that they can start playing and digging and doing their natural things. What um, are we doing to make sure that they don't love us? So it's a hard part of rehab. We don't want the animals to love us though and uh, we've done a good job if they don't like us, which is always hard, but it's always really rewarding too.
and keeping their fear of humans, pets, and any unnatural noises. And they have to be rehabbed with others. We never, ever rehab a single animal, just one. And it's different for all different types of animals. The skunks, you can see, are eating very different from the squirrels. So here's our baby groundhog, Tater. He is enjoying his bottle. He's a loud eater. And he was released back into the wild. I have a picture of him growing up later. So we also quarantine our rabies vector species. Being allowed to rehabilitate rabies vector species was such a big honor for us as rehabilitators this year, starting 2020, after being illegal for 25, over 25 years, but it comes with a huge responsibility. So we are very, very careful in how we're rehabbing these animals. We quarantine them for 14 days. That means we have a single baby is not going with any others or near any others for 14 days. Um, and we vaccinate all of our rabies vector species with rabies and sometimes distemper and other vaccines, but that's such an important part of three years rabies. It's a big part of what we can do to help these animals survive in the future and also decrease our rabies uh, occurrence. And we use a strict, a strict quarantine and exposure protocol and we have an entire space for that in our center. Housing, you have to think about that. What are you putting the animals in? And it's different from species to species. A baby squirrel is not the same size as a newborn a fox. So this is a squirrel for their little tiny squirrels this big. So we have a hammock for them to sleep in, some wood for them to chew on, a box for them to dig in, their fruits and veggies and diet and their water, a place for them to cuddle in. And these guys are small and as they grow they go bigger and bigger and bigger and it's different for every single species that we have. This is one of our converted horse stalls for, at the center. Um, we use it for our bigger animals, like our baby gray fox. They love to be in the stall. And then once they were big enough, they moved into a giant outdoor enclosure. So they had a lot of fun in there though. And right now we have raccoons in one and the beavers in another. This is our fox habitat. It um, was specially built. It has a shed in the front of it so that we can close a door so they don't see us. We put the food in there. Then we can open the door from the outside so they never see us give them food. And that is a great way to keep them unhabituated from us and keep them really wild. But they love this and we're building more platforms in this right now and a whole set of boxes back here for them to be able to hide and play more. Um, but this is a really big enclosure and they've done well. And here is, this is, if you guys remember the video of the pneumonia fox, this is her right here, the big fox. And she got a friend <laughs> and they're playing outside and she was able to recover from her pneumonia thanks to our awesome donors who gave us that oxygen chamber and they're outside in their habitat and loving it. So again, we never raise babies alone. Here's our box turtle enclosure. Like I said earlier, part of conservation. We had turtles mate here. There, there's some turtles right here. Uh, we had 33 in here at one point, but they made it in here. Then they hatched some uh, box turtles that we got to release. So the best part of rehabbing is release. I think it's the best part of rehabbing. It is what we all wait for. It feels so good when you get that sick animal in, you're able to successfully get it all the way to the end where it's able to be released. So these are some raccoons that we recently released. It feels so good when they go up that tree and they're so good at climbing. And this is on our property, so you can see all that forest that they have. Oh. And then the other one didn't want to miss out on climbing. They're nice and big and healthy. Morgan, I have a question about the box turtles. Yeah. Um, I know that they, um, or I've, you know, learned that, that you know, that they stay in their home territories yeah. their whole lives. And if you move them out of their territories, 
they right. can just get lost, you know, they, whatever. So do you, do you release, try to release them back where they were found? Yeah. So people uh -huh. will come back and pick them up and everybody gets super excited or we have their address and bring it to where they were found. So the turtles that can go back home, we do let have the people come and pick them up and people are so awesome. They've driven so far to be able to pick that animal back up. But yes, we put turtles back where they're found, the box turtles, like the little hatchlings, obviously they're just newly hatched so we can release them on our property. And then a few animals here and there, the turtles um, that are victims of deforestation, they obviously can't go back home. And we release them on our property and we actually see them. I've seen several turtles that we have done that to and we still see them around. So they've done well, but yeah. Do you mark them? No, we can tell because a lot of them come in with their injuries. Mm -hmm. So you can see the cracks on their shells. And Ruby is just awesome at identifying her turtles that she has worked on. So she always knows who it is. But we want to eventually get uh, pit tags to be able to do research on our turtles. And that's a future project that we'd love to get a sponsoring for to be able to see what these guys' habits actually are, the ones that can't go back to their home to their home range. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Um, well, we do have a few more. Um, okay. uh, Tobias wants to know if there's a specific process to become a rehabilitator for birds. Um, and a second question, is the licensing apprenticeship process different um, than the one mentioned earlier, I guess, for birds? Um, I honestly don't know much about birds. We don't, we only do NAML mammals and reptiles, but you can look on the ncwildlife.org website and they have a whole printout of all the necessary requirements to be able to do those species. I think with songbirds, and don't quote me, I think you need a special licensing because they're migratory birds, but I'm not positive. We just do the mammals and reptiles. Okay. Um, and the Carolina waterfowl rescue might be able to answer that question for you. Right, yeah, they do the birds and the raptor center. And then Carol would like to know if you know any uh, wildlife rehabbers in or near Stokes County. I'm not sure where that is. Is it on the coast or? Um, I'm not sure, but I can post up a, a list of rehabbers. The state has made an entire list of licensed rehabbers. So you can search by county or by town and it will show you the people in your area or close to your area. You might have to drive a little bit, but there should be somebody close enough in your vicinity. Um, hopefully, Kara, I believe it was, you find help for the animal you need help with or um, can find somebody close. Um, and uh, talking about the raccoons, is there a treatment for the canine distemper other than you know vaccinating the healthy ones, but if yeah. you get one in, do they usually survive? Yeah, so we just got one the other day and a little girl asked me the same question. She was so beyond her years and intelligence, she amazed me. But um, the distemper, if we're getting them in, it's generally pretty severe. So the distemper affects the neurological system just like it does the, just like rabies does. But we get more of the goopy eyes um, and the snotty nose. They have a green tint to their pupils. Um, they don't do very well, unfortunately. I think a lot of research can be poured into distemper. And I'd love um, to work with the state on that or anybody who'd be interested, any college students who'd want to research on them. You can give uh, specific antibiotics, but we haven't found them to be that successful because usually when we get them in, they're so severe. And the most severe, what happens, they neurologically decrease, they stop eating, they get very emaciated, and then they go into seizures. So it's hard to pull them through that. Um, and then Margaret wants to know if there's a vet on staff for performing surgery. Yeah, no, we don't know a vet on staff. We work with a couple of different vets and vet clinics, and we have to schedule our appointments to be able to go in there, but they're so amazing. They all have um, really stepped up to helping us. They open up the clinic for us, and um, Atrium, Dr. Lauren Atrium Animal Hospital are just 
phenomenal and they always, always help us in Dr. Morrison. So we don't have a vet on staff, but I would love to eventually, that would be that's probably one of our goals as a clinic to be able to in the future have a whole expensive, extensive wildlife hospital. Okay, that's great. Um, do you, uh, let me see, who is this? Um, Mary wants to know, do the small animals get imprinted like birds after someone has kept it in for five weeks? Um, I'm not sure what small animals that's specifically referring to. Um, bunnies, definitely not. We just got somebody who had bunnies for like two months and they were very wild. Um, squirrels, we got somebody who had um, a squirrel and once we put her with others, then she got wild again. And once we put them outside, they get pretty wild. So I'm not as concerned about the small animals as I am or the raccoons raised a single or a fox that is raised trying to be a, a dog pet. But the small animals are pretty good at becoming wild. Okay. Um, and Ernie says, money must be your primary need for donors, but what other things do you need and how is it best to, uh, what is the best way to get them to you? Um, so we can use so many different things. Um, enrichment items, we have a whole Amazon wish list, which has a var large variety of things that we need from like outdoor dog kennels to syringes to toys for raccoons. So we have a lot of stuff on there. Um, any medical supplies, we can always use that. And the best way to get it to us is to text our hotline and then we can arrange a drop off with, you, with whoever wants to come and drop it off and donate. That's a good question, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Do you accept volunteers for habitat building? Um, yeah, oh yeah. If somebody wants to come build and they're good at it, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are doing 18 and older right now just because um, of state regulations, but yeah, we are, can use to build more raccoon habitat specifically right now. If somebody's handy, we'd love it. Okay, well that was from Chris. Chris also wants to know if you would accept veterinary oral syringes that have been autoclaved. Um, yeah, send us a photo, text us a, a photo. We'll let you know if we can use it. Obviously, if we don't wanna waste if we can't, but text us a photo. I'll get that number to everybody and then we can see um, what those are. But that sounds like we can definitely use them, yeah. Okay, and Kara says, um, Oops, wait a minute. Stokes is near Forsyth County, uh, which is Winston-Salem, and oh, she's yeah. only been able to locate someone that helps with raptors near there, so she hasn't been able to find um, There's wildlife ink up there. There's a ton of rehabbers in Winston-Salem. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that list out, but Wildlife Rehab Inc. is a, a good organization up there, and they have a big network. Okay, well, that's about, that's caught us up for now. Okay, I'm almost finished. This is the last part release. Are we good on time? Are we good? I'm just gonna finish up real quick. Yes, we're fine on time. Okay, all right, good. So um, release, so uh, the video before of the groundhog that was uh, eating his bottle, that's him. This is Tater and this is Tater all grown up. I think he looks like a Roman statue sitting up there but that's what we do with these babies small they come in small unable to care for themselves and this is tater and he is able to eat and he got released on our property we have fields in the front so he, um he's living a happy groundhog life so things we determine if they're ready or not um things we look at are the size and age we go through so many books to be able to know what other people are doing natural behaviors. We're constantly reading, guys. We're always educating ourselves. I'm always pulling out my books, looking through them, making sure that I'm going through all the references I can before I make decisions. But there's a specific size and age for everybody. I think groundhogs are like four months, um, and that's a pretty good size for a groundhog to know that he's ready. They're exhibiting their natural behaviors, eating their natural diet. They're fearful of humans. They're not going to walk up to anybody. They're gaining weight and growing without formula. They've been weaned for a long time before we release animals. Other factors to consider. 
the weather. We're not releasing animals if it's going to storm. This week we have some squirrels that could have been released, but I think it's supposed to rain the next couple of days, so we've been keeping them in, and that's for the better of them. We want these guys to be successful in the wild, and we got to set them up for success. We're looking at location. A beaver, we're not going to release in the woods. We're going to go put him in a place that's safe, a natural preserve that Um, or a turtle, if it's a, a quack turtle, where are we putting that turtle? What do they need? A possum needs a stream to go by, um, other things like that. The time of day, bunnies we're releasing at dawn or dusk. They're crepuscular, so we're not releasing a bunny in the middle of the day. We're releasing them next to a bush so they have cover. And the time of year, should we release them? Um, we can't release animals like in December when it's cold because what are they going to eat? Where are they going to go? So we have to make sure we overwinter a lot of animals because of that. Um, so we keep, that means we keep animals in our care for the winter so we can, we can release them in the spring. Are we releasing them in a group or a single? This beaver came in as an adult and um, so he could be released alone, but um, a group is better for animals like squirrels. They can cuddle together. And our soft or hard release. So a soft release would be something like this. These are some of our enclosures that are outside. So they have a little tiny door over here. So a soft release would be just opening that and letting them go whenever they want. So unfortunately, I don't see a lot of our animals be released because we do this a lot. But um, Sometimes we'll come in in the morning and they're still de there and we feed them and let them take as long as they need. And sometimes they're like, peace out, I'm ready to go, bye. And then this possum, um, this is when I was rehabbing out my house, I would release him by the stream in Mint Hill. So here's a video and you guys can say what type of release this is. This is our fox cages. And this is the fox, remember the fox who came in with pneumonia, that coughing video. And then she was playing with her little baby fox out in the cage. And then this is her being released. Her name was Butter. So we saw Butter for a while and we're working to get camera traps set up and so that we can see the wildlife at night. We, I can hear them all the time, I just can't see them. So we hope to do more research on our animals. So what type of release is that? Is anybody, is anybody commenting? Soft. Yeah, yeah. Soft. Very soft release, yes. And that's what we do at this yeah. point right now. Okay. So again, we need your help. Um, first and foremost, be an advocate for wildlife. And I'm sure everybody here is already. That's why you're attending this and expanding your knowledge. But just using your voice on Nextdoor when you see silly things posted, just go ahead and comment, post up links of the truth and support the truth and break the myths of animals, uh, be an advocate for wild places. You can check out our website to see how you can volunteer. We may be doing a baby squirrel class, a baby squirrel feeding class um, in the spring, so be looking for that. We run on donations, so I said we don't receive any government or state funding to take care of all the have the means to give a monetary donation collecting acorns and bringing them, um, getting your community involved, sharing our information with people. That's a, a good way to help. And you can visit our website more for that. And that is all. Okay. Um, we've had a few more questions. Um, will you have a Christmas tree donation event this year or will, or will COVID present that, prevent that from happening? Um, we will have a Christmas tree donation. I think that we will. It will be more of just a pop in and drop off type of situation, but I think we will still be doing that. Okay. And um, one more question. Mary wants to know, do you ban the animals before you release them? No, we don't ban them. We don't have permitting for that. And that's more for birds. Thank you guys. Aww.
that's fine. So again, um, check check out the um, Carolina Wildlife Conservation Center, like she said, at her website. Mm -hmm. On they're on Facebook. If you follow them, then you get you know you get to see the the little tinies as they as they grow up. You know as they're growing, and um, they posted some of the releases. So that's really really fun to watch. Yes, absolutely. and Morgan, uh, this is Margaret. Uh, mm -hmm. We will we did get the program recorded, so it will be posted on our on our link later on. Uh, because in the past we've posted our Bard Owl program and flattening the plastic curve. I think it will go on this week. That was okay. our October meeting. So I don't know when it'll go on, but we will post it. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you guys for having me. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, thank you, Morgan. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That's that. right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank and you. Thanks for attending. All right. Bye.